Well, we're going to discuss menus and recipes, part one. So this module consists of compare and contrast different types of styles of menus, explain the purpose of standardized recipes, write and use standardized recipes, measure correctly and convert from one measurement system to another, convert recipe yield and portion size amounts, Calculate unit cost, recipe costs, and selling prices. Explain the need for and describe best practices for cost controls in food service operations. And describe the elements of a recipe for publication and the process for producing a recipe for publication. The menu is simply a list of food and beverage available for purchase, but it's way more than that. It's also the soul of every food service operation. Its menu is an important sales tool as well as an important marketing tool for the restaurant. And the menu will greatly depend on the type of restaurant and in which category and where in that category it falls. Four types of categories of restaurants, fast casual, quick service, casual dining, and fine dining. Let's take a look at each one. Restaurants is one of the newest categories of restaurants, and it consists of mostly things such as delis, such as Jason's Deli, Schlotzky's Deli, and various other different kinds of delis. Along with this also falls under the category of things such as grocery store deli items as well. Quick service restaurants, also known as QSR, are another name for saying fast food. This type of restaurant can run the gambit from the low-end fast food items that are fast food items you might find in a convenience store or the high-end fast food items such as Chick-fil-A or some other kind of category. Casual dining is one of the largest segments of restaurants and consists of restaurants such as Chili's and Applebee's and various different sit-down restaurants. Typically what separates this type of restaurant from others is the dress code and the sit-down capability or dining room capability of a restaurant. Typically you will find servers in this type of restaurant as opposed to just grab and go from the countertop. Fine dining restaurants are on the spectrum from the low-end fine dining such as some of your Casual dining restaurants fall into this category as well, such as restaurants that are steakhouses and things along those lines. Typically, what you're going to find with fine dining restaurants are going to be a specific style of dress code is required, and it will typically require reservations. Fine dining can also have what we know of as the uber fine dining, which is the extreme high end of dining as well. These are going to be your very extraordinarily fancy restaurants that require jackets and ties for men and dresses or pantsuit for women. There are four different types of menus that we also talk about when we talk about the various different kinds of menus. This menu is based on the type of operation that you have. The static or fixed menu is typified by items that don't really change a lot. They stay the same and very seldomly will something new be added to it. All patrons are offered the same food every day. This type of menu is often seen in quick service restaurants or fast food restaurants and change very little notwithstanding the occasional special. A cycle menu is a menu that is developed for a specific set of time and at the end of that period it repeats. Oftentimes, this type of menu is used in institutional settings with a captive audience, hospitals, schools, and prisons. A market menu is based on the product that is available in the market. Price is also based on market availability. This type of menu is often seen in upscale restaurants on seafood dishes or meat dishes, as the cost of these ingredients can fluctuate wildly. Hybrid menus are those menus that combine the best qualities of the static, the cycle, and the market menu styles. This is probably the most common style of menu that is found in the middle, of high, middle to high-end restaurants from Chili's to Delmonico's in New York City. 
There are several different styles of menus as well. A la carte. A la carte, or everything on the side, every food and beverage item is priced and ordered separately. Semi a la carte, some items are priced and ordered separately and some are priced to include other items. Table haute, or prefix menu, offers a complete meal at a set price. And menu de gestion, or tasting menu, offers small portions served in four or more courses at a fixed price. Restaurants can be a la carte. That simply means that all of the different menu items can be purchased individually and they each have their own individual price. It's also true that restaurants can be prefix. They can have a set menu, perhaps with some choices within that menu, and it prescribes how many courses you're going to have and what you're going to pay for the overall food experience. A la carte dining gives the guest the most choice. They can choose how much or how little they're going to eat. They could order a few appetizers, or they could order an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert. Or they could order nothing but dessert. There's no prescription on how they're going to use the restaurant. They also can decide how much money they're going to spend during their dinner or their meal. In a prefix restaurant, or a restaurant with fixed price, there's a set menu. Maybe it's four courses, or maybe it's a tasting menu with many courses. And that menu comes at a specific price. The tasting menu, or the multi-course menu with prefix, is at the restaurant's decision. The restaurant decides how many courses a guest will have, and how much they will pay for all of those courses combined. Serving a multi-course menu to a guest or a, a tasting menu requires some careful thought and consideration. You want to have a progress of dishes that makes sense and is enjoyable for the guest. Much like a story, you don't want all the exciting part to be in the beginning so that people end up being bored with the menu as it continues. It's important to build on the menu in a way that is refreshing and enjoyable and creates some anticipation for what's coming next. Often, multi-course menus will have multiple courses before a main protein item, like an entree, that is considered the climax of the savory part of the meal. Sometimes tasting menus have multiple dessert courses that may end with pettifors or chocolates. When serving a multi-course or tasting menu, timing is critical. If the food comes too fast, the guests are not going to enjoy it. And if it takes too long, they're gonna wonder what's going on and they're gonna get impatient. That connection of timing and enjoyment is critical for a multi-course menu. In a restaurant, it is required that the kitchen and the dining room have wonderful communication about the pace at which a guest is enjoying their meal. Some people will eat fast and some people will eat more slowly. It's very important that a table be treated as a whole. Everyone should be cleared from each course together, and the restaurant should be able to provide a sort of wave-like progress where the table is prepared with all of the correct service ware, the beverages are poured, and then the food is delivered. Everyone enjoys their food, and then the dishes are cleared, the service ware is replaced, the table is crumbed, the beverages are poured, and the next course arrives. Now, the only way that can happen in a beautiful and consistent and appropriate manner is if the dining room is letting the kitchen know how quickly people are eating and when he perceives that they might need a breather, when they might need a break before they continue with their next course. The kitchen needs to be able to respond to the changing tempo of all of the different dining room tables and how they are dining either quickly or more slowly. This is the dance of the restaurant business in multi-course menus and tasting menus, making sure that the kitchen, the dining room, and the guest are all performing the dance in the right way, in the right tempo, 
for the guests' ultimate enjoyment. Singer, also known as Truth and Menu, there are several federal and state laws that require that certain menu language be accurate concerning the quality of items, the quantity of items served, the grade of food, such as the grade of beef, freshness, and any nutritional statements intended to prevent misleading health claims are carefully regulated by the FDA. Consumer safety advisories may be required on menus depending on local regulations, such as warnings about underdoneness of beef or use of eggs. In the next section, we'll explore how standardized recipes can control food service cost, as well as some other control, cost control methods. Standardized recipes should be created for every item on your menu, whether you are doing ranch dressing, cream of broccoli soup, or a steak and potato entree. They will produce a known quantity and quality of food for a specific operation. Standardized recipes include the type and amount of each ingredient, the preparation and cooking procedure, and the yield and portion size. There are several things that affect food cost. Chefs must learn to control the following. Menus, purchasing and ordering, receiving, storing, issuing, kitchen procedures establishing standard portions, kitchen procedures managing waste, sales and service. So let's look at the menu for a second. Profitable menu design takes into account these factors. Customers' desires. What a customer wants to eat will oftentimes drive what you serve on your menu. Equipment and physical space limitations. If your menu consists of predominantly fried foods, you have to have enough space in your kitchen to operate several fryers. If you have a lot of fried food and only one fryer, you're not really going to be very effective. Ingredient availability. There are times of the year whenever certain ingredients are just simply not available. A good fresh melon or a nice uh, piece of uh, vegetable that may not be available during that season is oftentimes better to use a substitute or not even sell it than it would be to try and serve it as a unpar or subpar vegetable. The cost of goods of an item, we refer to this as cost of goods sold, also known as food cost. Employee skills and competition. In purchasing and ordering, there are several things that can be involved in controlling your food cost. Techniques impact food cost controls as well. Par stock, is, which is the amount of stock necessary to cover operating needs between deliveries. Inventory and ordering systems, perhaps you're using a manual ordering system versus a, an electronic ordering system or an inventory system, which is done on a clipboard versus done on a computer. Purchasing specifications are the following. Item, grade, quality, packaging, and unit size. It is important to know your purchasing specifications because if you tell your vendor you need romaine lettuce and what you wanted was a case of romaine lettuce heads and what you got was a case of bagged cut romaine lettuce, this is not necessarily going to work for you. Controlling food costs and the receiving of products is equally important. Standards for receiving goods ensure cost controls. A chef must confirm product ordered. You want to verify it with what the product was that was ordered is what you received. Verify the item on the invoice that was delivered. Oftentimes you may have what's called a mispick. This is an item that is put on the list by mistake, but yet will have the sticker for another item on the box. Verify that quantity is delivered. If you say that you received 200 pounds of ground beef, you want to make sure that you actually receive 200 pounds of ground beef because that's exactly what you're going to pay for whether you got it or not. Verify price billed as ordered. You want to do some math, so it's oftentimes handy to have a calculator handy just to run the numbers to verify that they are what they are. 
and maintain proper cold storage temperatures. If your walk-in cooler is out of storage, this can affect your product quality. Your product quality is key to being able to run a successful uh, operation. If you serve subpar, pro subpar product, your customer will know it. In the storing and issuing of products, you can control food costs here as well by proper storing, preventing spoilage, theft, and waste. We want to use the FIFO stock rotation, which is first in, first out. This is where we take the oldest product and we rotate it to the front of the line and put the newest product in the back of the line. There are situations where you may want to use the LIFO or last in, first out. This would be whenever you need the freshest ingredients, such as on a salad bar versus going into a stock. Limiting your storeroom access and protecting inventory records minimizes waste. Standard portions are important to a restaurant industry. We want to make sure that we're giving the exact same portions out for everyone, not just for consistency's sake, but also for cost-wise. Establishing standard portions controls food costs. Without uniform portion quantity, it'll be impossible to compute portion costs accurately. Check plates coming back cleared from the table for waste products. Waste is a costly problem. For instance, if I sold two ounces of mashed potatoes for every order, more than what my spec calls for, if my mashed potato costs five cents an ounce, that's 10 cents for every portion that I'm selling out the door. If I'm selling 200 portions of that a day, that's $20 gone a day. Over the lifespan of a year, that's $7,240 in two ounces of mashed potatoes. Portion size depends on the menu, prices, and customers' desire. Purchasing pre-portioned items can help prevent waste. You just want to make sure that you're buying good quality pre-portioned items. In managing waste, we always want to talk about how we eliminate waste in the process as far as overproduction of food, overcutting of steaks, things along those lines can be costly. Accurately forecasting the amount to prepare. We use our sales history to be able to do this, to look back on days past and say, okay, well, on this day, we did X amount of sales. In this category, we sold this amount of these products. Maybe on a Friday night, you're going to sell 10 times more steaks than what you would sell on a Monday night. Obviously, for Mondays, you don't prep as much. Use prep list to avoid this waste problem. You want to make sure that your prep list is broken down for par levels depending on your business and how much in sales you anticipate doing. Use leftovers from the prep. Now, I'm not recommending using scraps that are unusable. But for, say, instance, if I fabricate a beef tenderloin and I have scraps of beef tenderloin left over that are still good quality, I can use those in stir fry or kebabs or any number of different recipes. And purchase foods in proper forms to avoid unnecessary waste. Uh, if your operation does not allow for you to be able to do fabrications and cuts, then purchasing prepackaged items is a good way of being able to do that. Your sales staff will have an impact on your costs. They are your marketers and they are your sellers. They're the first line marketers to help control your cost, so they need to be aware of what it is they're serving. They require proper training on menu items. It's often uh, one of the overlooked things that you might do is make sure that your staff understands the tastes and the flavors uh, that go into a menu item, but also what ingredients go into a menu item. Chef and service staff work together to ensure cost efficiencies. Your service staff is going to be the ones that are going to notice things that are not selling or are going to notice things that are coming back with more frequent regularity. In your recipe writing, let's talk about recipe writing 101. Chefs are called upon to write recipes for any number of publications, whether they're magazines or books, maybe it's your kids' uh, high school uh, cookbook for fundraising. There's any number of different applications you may want to write a recipe. Know the important parts of a well-written recipe. Well recipe. The name of the recipe is important. That's your marketing. Fall off the bone barbecue ribs. Well, if they're not fall off the bone, then it's mismarketing and you're going to miss your intended market on that. 
yield or the number of servings is important. We want to know that uh, this uh, particular recipe serves six. <laughs> yeah, six. I'm going to eat about four of those myself. The head note at the top, or in this case at the bottom below the picture, is a text that describes something about the recipe, the ingredient, or how it's made, or it could even be a quote from your favorite customer about the menu item. In summary, let's talk about our takeaways for this lesson. The menu is the main marketing tool for a restaurant. Everything is built and designed around that menu. Even your recipe, even your kitchen space is designed around your menu and what you're capable of producing. For each type of restaurant, there are multiple variations within each category, from the low end to the high end. The style of menu is usually determined by the type of restaurant and vice versa. Truth in menu, what you purpose, you must perform. Standardized recipes are designed to standardize food cost. And teach your staff and use them to help market the menu. Listen to them and they will tell you what it is your customers want.